Nurul Islam grows rice on land that may soon be underwater. Here along the southeast coast of Bangladesh, climate change-related sea level rise threatens to submerge one million hectares of agricultural land and displace 40 million people, many of them farmers like Nurul. There are more storms. They are no longer predictable. Sometimes, if we have crops, we cut them and we tie them to containers which float. Within two or three hours, the water recedes. Then we struggle to start all over again. Nurul and his family have already been displaced once. When their farm was washed away 12 years ago, they moved here to this char, or new land, created naturally from layers of silt carried in rivers flowing down into the Bay of Bengal. But after more than a decade on Nolar Char, Nurul and his family still live without electricity and running water. And salt water intrusion has become a growing threat to his crops. There is no dam, so the high tide floods our land and sweeps away our seedlings. We replace the seedlings, but by the time the season comes to an end, the crop doesn't grow as it should and there is lower yield. In some cases, yields are half of what they should be, and as a result, poverty and malnutrition are growing in coastal communities. To avoid a bigger crisis, farmers need to adapt to climate change, says Thomas Rath from the International Fund for Agricultural Development. People have to adapt their, their livelihoods, have to adapt their, their production patterns, have to adapt the way they generate income to the changing environment. So in, in terms of uh, agriculture, agriculture has to invent and develop technologies that cope with the effects of climate change. Some of what Rath talks about is happening here, on another accrued patch of land known as Boyerchar. Newly constructed sluices prevent salt water from contaminating freshwater canals. And embankments, high enough to hold back a seven-meter rise in sea level, trace the coastline. Farmers, too, are being armed with training and new technologies. Anjana Baladas harvests a high-yielding variety of rice, specially bred to grow in salinated water. With this variety, we earn more, we can pay for our children's education, and we can also save a bit. Improving farmers' incomes while protecting them from climate change threats is the focus of an ambitious development project involving six branches of government and international donors like IFAD. Zanel Abedin is deputy team leader. Many uh, people lost their land two times or three times even. Uh, now we provided them many protections and they are now saved at least. So far, about one million coastal people have been assisted by the project. And now, back on Nolar Char, Nurul and his neighbors will soon be among them. It's hard to predict what impact climate change will have here over the coming decades. But for the immediate future, at least, efforts like this are buying farmers more time. This is the third drought to hit West Africa in recent years, sending people reeling as their crops and livestock wither away. Herders are finding it harder and harder to find water for their animals. Food prices are soaring, savings evaporating. In the past year, the harvest for millet, the main staple crop, was down 37 percent in Chad, and here in Abeche's market, it now costs 28 percent more. Hunger is on the rise, and the most vulnerable are the hardest hit. Fatima is 19 months old. The red means that she is severely malnourished and needs to be in the hospital. Her mother, like many of the women here, walked for more than three hours in the heat to come to this clinic in Abeche. The World Food Program plans to have to assist almost 9 million people in the region this year. That's quadruple the amount being reached now. In eastern Chad, there's the additional challenge of feeding refugees who fled the war in Darfur. 270,000 of them living in desert camps like this one in Ariba. Chad is about as far away from anywhere as you can get. This food, mostly sorghum, 
is being pre-positioned because when the rains come, the roads are impassable and there's no way to get the food to people who need it most. Benghazi, Libya is 3,500 kilometers that way, but we can't use that route anymore because of the conflict. Douala, Cameroon is 2,700 kilometers that way, and Port Sudan, where all this food came from, is 2,500 kilometers, a three-week journey across Sudan that way. Special peanut-based nutritional products are also being deployed to prevent more children from slipping over the edge. This stuff um, is used to be able to provide the right nutrients to children who are at risk of severe acute malnutrition. So this is not food per se, this is, is closer to being a, a medicine. The World Food Program is looking for longer term solutions as well. Here, a dam is being built to collect the precious water that comes when the rains begin in June. And here, a vegetable garden grows in the desert. Workers are paid with food, helping them help themselves while creating desperately needed infrastructure that will make the community more resilient. In Abeche's hospital, it's clear that the frontline defense against the drought is proper nutrition. Severe malnutrition can prevent the youngest from ever reaching their full potential. If it's widespread, a whole generation can be lost to hunger. The Bolaita zone in southern Ethiopia is a chronically food insecure area and is affected by reoccurring droughts. Like most farmers in the area, Vedebo Wai has only a small piece of land. His crops often suffered from disease and low yields. Production was low. Before, we lived in poverty. The food we produced at the farm was not even enough to feed my family. Because we didn't have enough food at home, sometimes my children had to go to the neighbors to ask for food. In 2010, he was selected to get support from FAO's Root and Tuber project. He received 100 kilos of taro planting materials from the organization. His first harvest was nine months later. <laughs> It's around 8 kilos. This is an average plant at this farm. He produced 1,600 kilos of taro on less than 0 0.04 hectares of land. His production has increased by more than three times. Now I can feed myself and my family. Thanks to God, there is no more poverty in my house. Uh, we are targeting the most vulnerable farmers who are seed insecure, who are uh, food insecure, and we provide planting materials. And they grow and they consume and they sell. Uh, so far, we have supported 47,000 food insecure households. Vedebo and his wife, Amarech Ata, sort through the roots to find the largest one to sell at the market. These high-yielding varieties that Vedebo and other farmers now have are developed by research centers in Ethiopia. In the past, very few farmers had access to these products. So what FAO has done is linking research stations, universities who own these varieties with the farmers. The district agricultural office targets beneficiaries that meet the admission criteria. We select farmers that are food insecure, but have enough arable land to plant the root and tuber crops. Thank you God for giving us this blessed food. The project brought significant change, not only for Vedebo, but for his children as well. Before, I would only go to school when I was able to resist the pain from hunger. We used to skip classes every other day. Now we eat breakfast every day and I can keep up with my class. My body was in a bad condition. I didn't have much strength. Now I am much better. I can even breastfeed my child. Mulgeta Ambelu is a farmer in Hararge in eastern Ethiopia. 
he received new planting materials for sweet potatoes and Irish potatoes in 2010. After my first harvest, I was able to pay back all my debt. I even returned the seed tubers and distributed planting materials to 10 other farmers in my village. Because the farmers share the high-yielding planting materials with other farmers, the number of beneficiaries increases day by day. With the money from his new production, Mulgeta was able to save enough to buy a cow and a goat. He now has enough food to feed his five boys and is not worried about the sixth child that will soon arrive. For Hungry Planet, I'm Astrid Runden.